We welcome you all on behalf of EPFL Library uh, for this uh, last day of uh, Open Science Evening Talks. So just uh, uh, a bit of uh, general background uh, information, especially for today's newcomer. Uh, the EPFL is um, organizing uh, an Open Science Summer School that uh, is for uh, uh, doctoral students and that is, last, uh, is lasting this whole week and is quite intense. And uh, this, uh, this event is, uh, is the, the way the library found to, um, to share uh, the essence of that, uh, uh, that uh, event with uh, the, the community at large and the general public. So um, uh, this last day, we've had uh, already um, nine great talks with international speakers, and um, th they covered um, many uh, aspects of uh, open science, such as well, uh, publications, research data, and the general landscape. And uh, this evening, last but not least, uh, we will uh, tackle the problematic of code and a related legal aspect of, of it. So um, to this, uh, we will have three talks, uh, each lasting um, a quarter of an hour, with then five minutes of questions and uh, answers for each talk. And uh, then if you wish to, uh, to continue the discussion and, and deepen the, the subject, we you will be able to do so over the, the apero with the speakers that will uh, find place just here. So um, our first speaker um, is uh, Victoria Stoden. She is an associate professor at the Graduate School of Library and Information Science at the University of Illinois. And she is also uh, affiliated to the Stanford Law School uh, Center for Internet uh, and uh, Society. Uh, so uh, Victoria is, um, is a specialist also in reproducibility in uh, computational science and also in the development of standards uh, on opening data and sharing code. Um, tonight, she will address uh, the main changes of uh, scholarly information uh, publication due to uh, the increased use of data. So the second speaker is uh, Michel Jacquard. Michel Jacquard is a, is a lawyer. Um, he has a strong expertise in new technologies. He has both um, um, degrees from the University of Lausanne here and uh, the University of Columbia. And he can uh, both, he is allowed both to practice here in Switzerland and in New York. And he has also founded the law firm um, Ed Est Avocat based here in Lausanne. And he will uh, talk about uh, how uh, lawyers uh, can play an important role in open science. So our last speaker, uh, Luc Henry, uh, will do the closing remarks. And um, he is um, by training a chemist and um, a molecular uh, biologist. And he's an um, advisor to uh, our EPFL president, Martin Vetterli. And uh, uh, he is also uh, responsible for uh, the implementation of open science at EPFL. So without further ado, I give you the floor. Thank you. Thank you for the very nice introduction. So it's a real pleasure to be here. And I find I don't often get to do talks like these where you address a very broad audience and, in fact, members of the public. And so this is one of my favorite things to do. So I'm really very happy to have the opportunity. So thank you. Um, so I wanted to spend a few minutes today, um, as was mentioned in the introduction, talking about how I see differences in uh, how we communicate scientific results in the future. And what we've had in the past, as everybody knows, is you write a scientific paper. And that paper, perhaps it is peer, usually peer-reviewed, and then that paper, 
this, what is actually becomes a PDF is made available to the public. So I, probably everybody has seen that. You might have to pay money to see the PDF, but generally speaking, all the results are written up in that PDF. So what I want to present today is a vision for a different way of making scientific claims um, uh, available. And it's not a, a vision that you know, it just came up with because I think it sounds really nice or it would, uh, you know, be nicer to read science in a certain way. I really want to spend some time um, convincing you that it's actually the right direction that we need to go and it's grounded in scientific norms actually as we go forward. So the older model of writing this, you know, scientific paper around our findings is no longer sufficient to capture what we've done as scientists that really need to travel with our claims to make our claims trustable and believable and verifiable. So that's what I'm going to try to build for you today. So that's why it's called the computable scholarly record. So we're going to have in this vision, I'm going to build up these computational aspects and how they are embedded in the scholarly record beyond just having that sort of PDF in the paper disseminated. Okay, so I wanted to spend a little bit of time unpacking reproducibility. I'll go relatively quickly through that because uh, I don't want to, a very short talk, so I don't want to spend too much time on that. Um, also, I'll go a little bit quickly through the research ecosystem. So if we're going to make changes, for example, to how we um, think about dissemination and what we're actually communicating with the findings, there are a lot of actors involved in that, not least of which is the library. So there's a, many different sort of facets of the ecosystem that have to align and agree on actually what we're doing. And then I was going to talk a little bit about the sort of the policy, the progress steps that have been made and end with really a sort of more concrete vision for what this computable scholarly record might allow us to do in the future that we can't do today that would really, I think, start to accelerate the types of questions we can ask on the, on the scholarly record itself. Okay, so unpacking reproducibility. So for the remainder of the talk, I'm going to lean on these norms. These are um, not, uh, not uncontroversial. So they, are, they were put together by Robert K. Merton in 1942, and what he was trying to do was characterize what makes the activities that we undertake as scientists different from activities you might undertake in other spheres of your life. The one that I want to focus on, we don't really need to worry about all of them, but I want to focus on the last one, skepticism. So this idea that scientific claims need to be exposed to critical scrutiny before they are accepted. So you have to, the idea is you have to at least have that ability to have other people critique your work and critique the claims in order to make them more accepted and trustable by the community. The idea, of course, in science is we don't know the answers. We are doing our best to come up with the right answer, but we, don't, we never know for an, the fact and the truth that we have the right answer. We always have this process of trying to convince people that uh, we've, we're really on the right track. Okay, so this was something that uh, Robert Boyle, so that's who that photo while well, drawing is there. Um, Robert Boyle instantiated this notion of skepticism in the idea of reproducibility in the 1660s. So he said that, um, as you are carrying out experiments in that write-up when you tell the community what you've done, so what we now basically became the academic paper, um, that paper needs to contain sufficient information that the experiment itself can be replicated or verified by a reader independently. So you don't, the idea is you don't need to get in touch with the original researcher to find out all the details of the experiment. It is not the case that I'm just informing you of something that I found, but I'm also delivering the tools to you where you can check it yourself. Right? So this really came out in the 1660s um, with, uh, with Robert Boyle here, and, and we still see this today in how you communicate the written aspects of your work as a scientist. We have the methods section, for example, where the intention is to detail everything that went into that discovery so that there's transparency. Okay, so we're in a different world today to boil, uh, needless to say. We have at least three giant changes that have come from technology over the last, say, about 20 years. So our entire ecosystem is in the process of responding to these sort of shocks by technology. Very briefly, of course we are, everybody's heard of big data, right? We have a lot of data. We don't just have data uh, that we're collecting more of the same type of data. We have new and different types of measurements and they're pushing on our ability to develop methods to withdraw information from noise in data sets. All sorts of methodological changes and, and innovations are happening because of big data. 
Uh, we also have a lot of increase, enormous increase in computational power, allowing us to ask different questions using simulations in a computational system to answer the questions themselves. So a lot of new science, new types of questions really being asked and answers that we've never had before. And then we also have this n new thing in point three, where all of this work with big data, with big com computation, with small data, and even small computation across the entire spectrum, requires the use of software and code. So anytime you have data, you have some software that's accessing it, that's housing it, that's allowing you to extract information from it. So software and data are very knitted together and linked in um, scientific research. So now we have contributions that enabled the discoveries that are sitting in the code themselves. They didn't fit in that method section. The method section doesn't look like code in the paper. So all of these instantiations of real scientific contributions are now coded in the software and only in the software. Generally speaking, we're still in that world where you read that scientific publication, you read the words in the method section, you don't actually get into the nuts and bolts of what has happened in the computational aspects of the research. You don't get into three, those contributions that are happening and sitting in the software. You don't get into the data, you don't get into all of these, these associated aspects of the discovery. So there's just a little quote there from a keynote that I grabbed off um, YouTube where Professor Lior Patchter is uh, giving this talk and he's saying that um, software contains ideas that enable biology and uniquely in software, not captured in that, in that write-up. So hopefully you are now interested that maybe I have a point with this computable scholarly record, so let's keep pushing on it. So I'm making two claims. Uh, one, that just about all the discoveries that happen in the scientific sphere today have a computational element. Not all, but just about all. And it could be something as simple as operations in a spreadsheet, or something as complicated as a massive simulation on a huge supercomputer. There's an entire scale, but they all have computational elements, code elements, data elements in there somewhere. Claim two, where I started our discussion is that I believe there's a mismatch in that write-up, that PDF, the traditional paper from Boyle's era, in disseminating and communicating the work that has been done that people need to know about in order to verify and have Boyle's level of scrutiny on the claim as it's being presented, on that computationally derived claim. So we have this mismatch. If you think about the complexity of some of the um, uh, code, some of the computational operations, even in small scale science, you can have an enormously complex number of statistical tests, for example, that have been visited on the data or models that have been fitted, for example. And it's very difficult or impossible to capture that in that little few paragraphs in the methods section, particularly in enough detail that you can really have the level of scrutiny boil envisaged. Okay. So I think we're getting to a position where we're going to see um, infrastructure for managing much more heavily computational work, bringing about more transparency to the computational work itself. So that transparency comes about because it will be a necessary ingredient for actually doing the work, so managing the jobs, keeping track of what's happening in your experiments, and it will create levels of efficiency and productivity in the work of a computational researcher they're probably not going to be thinking about Boyle, right? Even though I think all the roots of this are in Merton and in Boyle. Okay. So three different types of reproducibility um, I wanted to touch on. I think there are many discussions actually going on at all different levels in society today around reproducibility. The New York Times has articles about reproducibility. There are discussions at uh, the bench in a lab about reproducibility between a uh, graduate student and their mentor, for example. So we have the entire scale and range of specialties participating in this discussion. I think it's useful to pull out three sort of types of discussion that are happening around reproducibility. The first one I just call empirical reproducibility. So this is really what Boyle was thinking about. Obviously he wasn't working on computational research back in the 1660s, but empirical reproducibility, can I essentially take the same physical steps in your experiment as you did and end up with the same results? So if, I, if you can imagine at being at a um, uh, sort of a wet lab or a bench and actually doing the same manipulations on cells or whatever, whatever it is, that would be empirical reproducibility. Can I actually replicate that finding in a different lab, for example? So I contrast this with um, statistical reproducibility. So think back to when I was talking about big data, 
How do we extract information or findings from data? We know there's lots of noise in the data, uh, minimum measurement noise, there could be more complex types of noise in the data. So how do we ensure that our statistics are actually pulling out the signal out of that noise? And uh, that's a, a, a separate type of discussion to something like, have I done the same steps as you to get the same finding at, say, my bench? Okay, so those are two separate discussions, and then I think there's a, at least another discussion going on, a third one, computational reproducibility. So now that I have big data, or some data in digital form, I have code that's accessing, making sense of the data, what do, what do I need to think about in that type of workflow or that type of research process to allow it to be exposed to scrutiny in the community? So that those are elements that go to computational reproducibility. Each of these discussions are quite different in terms of their focus and in terms of their remedies. Okay, so I'll give you just a couple of quick examples here about um, each of the types of reproducibility. So for Empirical reproducibility, I think it might be a little bit difficult for you to read. Oh, by the way, in case you have a device with you, the slides are on my website if you wanted to follow along at your own pace or click on things or read things in more detail, so you should be able to just pull those up. Um, the panel on the left is a short report that was given, uh, published in Cell Reports in 2014, and it's telling the story, it's just two pages, and it's telling a story of how two labs had a grant from the National Institutes for Health, a lab at um, Harvard and a lab at Berkeley, and what they did is they put two months aside at the beginning of their project to ensure that the processes that were producing the, the output, the cells that they were working on from each of their labs, um, were the same. So you couldn't effectively look at one of the, the sort of cell outputs and determine what lab it was from. And it ended up, the reason this is published is it ended up taking them two years to do that reconciliation. And so I, I put this up here as an example of the, how difficult empirical reproducibility really can be. And I don't, I'm not talking about it much today, but I don't want to trivialize it as a, as, a, or as a problem. It's certainly very challenging in its own way. Um, on the right, I have a, a sort of a, um, screenshot of a conference uh, reproducibility issues in research with animals and animal models, just talking about one of the issues that attends to empirical reproducibility if you are, for example, killing animals in the course of your research, you can think of reproducibility as having very real costs and burdens that need to be taken into account if you are carrying out reproducibility, which is quite different to something like statistical or computational reproducibility. Okay. Statistical reproducibility, there's lots of things that go on in stats that can go wrong when you try to generalize your findings, say, to a new sample or a new setting. So I won't kind of go through them all, but have you used statistical methods correctly? That's essentially the crux of uh, statistical reproducibility. A lot of the methods are evolving. Uh, I mentioned how we have very high dimensional data now, so methods are evolving to cope with that. So we have situations where um, it's, it's, there's often um, uh, a lack of clarity about maybe what stats you might use or how to use them and um, use of new methods. So it's a, a quite a deep problem as well. How do you determine really what's a finding in your data or what's really just an artifact from the noise? How do you make that distinction? So lots of different ways that can go wrong. And I'll just mention that in January of 2014, the journal Science, um, I think it's still the highest impact factor journal in our publishing community. They enacted uh, some steps to deal with statistical reproducibility. So things like you have to disclose more transparently what you have done to your data, like in terms of outliers, in terms of sample size, and so on, so that there's greater transparency and greater review around the statistical aspects. So my example here is just how this goes to statistical reproducibility. It doesn't touch, for example, empirical reproducibility or computational reproducibility. Okay, computational reproducibility where I'll spend the remainder of the talk. So this um, quote that I have here, I think encapsulates uh, this notion of this mismatch I was trying to describe between a text write-up in an academic journal and the underlying work that has gone on for uh, the production of a computational finding. So the quote says that an article about computational science, so it could be something as simple as some work on your, on your laptop, on a spreadsheet, or, or any measure of computation that is in that discovery pipeline. But that, um, that article about computational science in a scientific publication, this write-up is advertising 
of the real work that's gone on. The real work is actually um, the complete set of instructions, data, the generated, the fi figures and tables, whatever your actual result is in the paper. So that's where you really see the scholarship in the collection of digital artifacts and their creation to support that claim. At the moment, those artifacts are largely hidden from a reader of the paper. So it's just sort of this very high level description of what's happened. This is called really reproducible research and it was a pioneered in the early 1990s um, by a geophysicist at Stanford, John Clairbout. Okay, the research ecosystem. So you start, okay, suppose, let, let's suppose you're convinced that there is a mismatch between how we disseminate computational findings and um, this, these traditional notions of transparency and scrutiny. If, if we want to change this, there's all sorts of levers and all sorts of different players in the system that have to, in some sense, change in a coordinated way. So here's some of them. <laughs> you might be able to think of more. So I put researchers in the middle because we tend to sort of, I find them prob probably because I am a researcher, I find them easier to identify with. But there are many different levers that work on that researcher and all and work on each other. So the researcher is, of course, affected by um, universities in terms of they, that's where their support comes from. That's who's going to hire them. That's who promotes them and evaluates them. So whatever their standards are for hiring, tenure, promotion, researchers are very influenced by this. If those standards don't include things like exposure of computational details, those steps that led to the figures in the table and so on, then it's very difficult for them to be convinced that they need to do work in a different way. University libraries, so this, the libraries also play a role in terms of enabling the sharing of these digital objects that I've been referring to, code, data. They can support this researcher's pipeline, so maybe they're going for promotion, but the libraries are making it easier for that researcher to pr produce really reproducible research. Publishers have a role to play, so when you publish your article, why are you just publishing the the sort of the gloss, the write-up of your experiment. They could enable a richer publication, like the data code, for example, workflow information. Um, funders, similarly, if they're funding research, they have sort of levers over how um, different artifacts are exposed and created as part of the research process. Um, scientific societies, so um, most scientific disciplines have societies that at least have an annual meeting where researchers get together and maybe there are ways there to start knitting together solutions so that people start moving as a community. Um, we've seen in the U.S. and in EU as well that government will start or can start um, making directives around openness and transparency and data and so on. I don't think they've made directives yet around reproducibility, but there was a memo from the Obama White House in 2013 that said you share data for verification purposes, verification of the scientific claims. So we're getting there. Like that, the, the conversation is sort of floating around reproducibility. So we have a, a, a difficult collective action problem because these pieces all kind of fit together and it's hard for one of these groups to act on its own and it's even harder for one unit in one of these groups to act on its own. So this is why this discussion is um, protracted even though hopefully I've convinced you without a doubt that we need to move in, in a direction towards greater transparency. Okay, the policy and progress. I just wanted to mention a few little pieces of progress that have happened this year that might make you feel good about the situation, especially just now that I mentioned this deep collective action problem that we're facing in order to make change. So this is a report that came out in April of this year from the National Academies of Science um, in, uh, uh, in uh, Washington, D.C., and it's called Fostering Integrity in Research. So I was a committee member, so we, um, that's why I'm familiar with the recommendations. But I wanted to highlight for you two recommendations, uh, number six and number seven. So the recommendation six in the report, and by the way, the report is free to download. You can just go to the National Academy's website and, and grab it if, if you're really interested. Um, research sponsors and science, engineering, technology, and medical journal and book publishers need to ensure that information sufficient for a person knowledgeable in the field and its techniques to reproduce reported results is made available at the time of publication or as soon as possible after publication. So the implication is there, let's take responsibility, maybe it should be larger than publishers, but at least one group can start to make, take responsibility for things like data, code, artifacts, and so on. Okay. Um, federal funding agencies, other research sponsors need to 
um, allocate funds to support long-term storage and stewardship of these artifacts so they persist, right? Who's taking responsibility for that? Archiving and access to data sets code necessary for the replication of published findings. Okay. So that, th I thought that was exciting. <laughs> so this is a publication from December of 2016, so almost a year ago. Um, uh, we put this together because you may have heard discussions, you may have heard discussions around reproducibility. Um, you've probably heard discussions around open data. There's lots of discussion around open data. Um, you probably have not heard discussions around open code. This seems to be a much more muted discussion. Uh, one of the things I've been subtly trying to argue throughout this brief talk is that code's just as important as data, especially if you think about it from a reproducibility and transparency perspective, like why we're actually sharing these objects in the first place. So this article, one of the things we wanted to do was really bring code up to the level of data in the discussion and link them around reproducibility. So we had a number of recommendations in this article enhancing reproducibility for computational methods. I'll just, I'll mention, them. there's seven. I'll mention them briefly. Um, so the first one is share the stuff, right? Get the artifacts out there, data code and so on. Um, get links in the article, so in that narrative, um, before you publish, so you're not kind of reading the article and then Googling around looking for maybe the data's out there somewhere. Like have them in links before, before the publication so it's just sort of seamless to go and, and get these artifacts. Um, and cite them, so if you, if you are linking out to data you've used, code you've used, even your own data, your own code, cite your stuff. Get it in there and then other people can sort of lift those citations and cite when they use your work or they use your data. And this can go a long way to rewarding the sharing of these objects and um, encouraging people to sort of release data and code and recognize this. We talked about you know, tenure and promotion standards and so on, so it starts to become part of this system. Um, the fourth one, when you do release these things, document them so they can be reused. <clears throat> um, journals can actually do things like, well, code is executable. Uh, they could run the code on the data and check that at least computationally the results in the article that's being published check out, right? It doesn't say they're scientifically correct, but they could at least sort of do this check. And I don't think it needs to necessarily be the journals. We could have any third party certifying her doing this. So just to bring more trust to, um, to the computational aspects of the findings. I, I won't have time to get into it today, but maybe the next speaker will touch on this a little bit. But one of my areas of research is how to use licensing, open licensing in particular, to facilitate reuse of uh, shared data, shared code, shared workflow pipeline information that's needed to do um, replication and reproducibility of the results. And the seventh recommendation, the last one, is really a, rec a, a recognition that this isn't obvious. So these things are not, it's not obvious necessarily how to best document this work. It's not obvious how you deal with privacy concerns and data that you want to share, for example. So there's an entire research agenda starting to emerge around reproducibility issues. So let's fund it and take it seriously as a discipline. So that's something that is, is emerging in different aspects of funding agencies, at least in the US. Okay, so this is my last slide. And so this is the vision that I wanted to leave you with. If we, if we, if we imagine a future where these artifacts are shared, so um, one claim that I presented to you at the beginning, at the opening, was we are publishing <clears throat> um, almost all computational work. There's a computational component in almost everything that gets published in science today. So traveling with those claims, you can imagine software, you can imagine data, um, input parameters, other metadata and information that allows that level of transparency for others to computationally reproduce that work. So think about that if every paper has that, those artifacts associated with it in the scholarly record. We've got a much richer scholarly record and we can do things like these queries that I'm just gonna mention to you that right now are essentially impossible with the scholarly record today, yet I think are queries that are just obvious from a researcher's perspective. These are very natural queries that a researcher would want to visit upon the scholarly record. So uh, query the scholarly record, show me uh, a table of effect sizes and p-values, so significance levels, for all phase three clinical trials in melanoma published after 1994. Just give me that table of the, the trial and the level. Return to me all the denoising algorithms that have been used to remove white noise 
from the famous Barber image and give me the citation where that algorithm was used in what paper or papers. Return to me a list of all the machine learning classifying algorithms that were used to do classification on, there's a famous um, acute lymphoblastic leukemia data set, and give me the misclassification rates associated with each of those algorithms. It's a really natural query to do. I could spend hours talking about this one because with um, RAs, we tr have tried this. So far, we're up to more than 200 student hours just trying to do this. Query the scholarly record. So gather up all the data that is um, associated with the BRCA1 gene, the whole genome uh, data, and combine it into a data set that is everything we got out there that I can work on. It's really, really hard, possibly impossible. We could even get creative. So we could do some bootstrapping. So we could reassign treatment and control labels randomly to cases in a particular published clinical trial and then calculate the effect size to so the significance. Do this. Um, uh, over and over again, and then compare the significance of what you actually got in the clinical trial to that histogram of results from your sort of bootstrap samples and see if you have a real difference. And you can do this for all the clinical trials, say, in 2003, and put them side by side and see how they differ from randomness, for example. So these are queries that I think are um, quite natural to researchers, that they would carry out given the opportunity, and they're virtually impossible today on this narrative-based, PDF-based scholarly record that we have, moving towards a future that um, I'm describing to you where we have associated code, data, implementations, workflows, those pipelines of research with the published claims. These could become trivial, right, and sort of normal queries that we would actually carry out on the scholarly record. Okay, so I will leave it there. Thank you. Thank you for the, this very interesting so talk. Uh, are there any questions, maybe? last slide is really eye-opening because, um, but I don't think it's only due to the point of making a PDF that has a method section. For instance, the BRCA1 problem of knowing all the mutations and everything that's associated with them, it's also a problem of patenting of the mm -hmm. gene. Mm -hmm. And um, it's actually, in a way, preventing people from knowing how important prevention is, yes. in my opinion, because yes. BRCA1, in fact, is a DNA repair factor, and it's not only involved in breast cancer, it gives an equally elevated risk for prostate cancer in men. And so the more people know about DNA repair and that our DNA is getting damaged all the time and that repair is essential to avoid disease, I mean, it's not just about the PDF, it's about these profit-making things like myriad gene yes. genomics, yes. Yes. which has the patent on this BRCA1 gene, and it's yes. preventing science from moving forward. Yes, uh, I, I agree with everything you're saying, and I think that's, that's a fantastic point. So I don't mean to characterize um, my kind of build up to this slide as the only way, or the only barriers that, 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 were, that were gonna be in our way with my 15 minutes, <laughs> you know, on a very complicated that's problem. Right. But I wanted to at least give a sketch. Um, but that's exactly right. So we have um, uh, many IP issues that can prevent this kind of transparency. We have, um, uh, we could see opportunities that I didn't touch on, for example, even in the PDF itself, where we could be more structured, say, about the abstracts, about reporting, about links that could enable some of these queries, even if we didn't necessarily have all the objects. So there are ways, um, I don't mean to say it's necessarily a complete argument. Um, there are ways uh, uh, to, to step towards this even before we get to this world of radical transparency, and your point beautifully highlights one of the reasons why it's an urgency, right? It's not just a question of, um, or maybe Boyle wants us to do it this way. It really is a question of how we carry out science that is um, responsible and um, high integrity, in a sense. So thank you. <laughs>